Bibles with you this evening, please open up with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. Now, I'm going to actually back up first and do a little bit of a review. Uh, all right, so let me just back up and do this. Saul has been rejected as king. We saw that way back in chapter 13, about three, three studies ago. His dynasty has been rejected. Then he was personally rejected back in chapter 15. So not only is his son's not going to sit on the throne, his time has been shortened to sit on the throne. And so at chapter 15, verse 22, Samuel said, Hath the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, because Samuel was disobedient to God, and as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. That's always true. That's still true today. And to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Then last week, we saw God waking Samuel up, saying, hey, quit mourning. We're starting in chapter 16, verse 1. And go out and anoint another king. And that king is going to come from the sons of Jesse. Now Jesse's an old man. He's an old man. And his children, some of them are old. He has eight sons and two daughters. Now David does not seem to get along with any of his brothers very well. But his sister's sons, he actually makes military leaders in his, in his, in his kingdom when he becomes king. And uh, I've always kind of thought that maybe, you know, if you've got seven older brothers you're going to get picked on a lot. That's just how it is, guys. And, uh, of course, the older ones probably didn't pick on him as much because they were grown, basically, when he comes along. But still, they don't respect him a lot. So so Samuel finally goes, and he's got his oil and the horn to anoint the new king of Israel. And he sees Eliab, the, the first son of, of Jesse. He says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Look at him. He looks like a king. Dark hair, dark eyes, not as tall as Saul. Of course, who was? Saul was like six foot eight. He was head and shoulders were taller than the rest of the Jewish men. But God says, no, 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 this is not the one. Don't look on the outside appearance. And this is a good lesson for you and me. Look on the inside. See who people really are, not just judge them for how their outside looks. So he brings the next son and the next son. You know the whole story, right? And finally, he gets to where... He says, is this all of your children in verse 11? Oh, there remains the youngest one. He keeps with the sheep. Now, how big a slide is that? Your dad don't even, you're going to have a, maybe a one time in your life meeting with Samuel, and he's invited your family to come with the elders of the city. And said, make sure all of your sons come. And you don't even care to bathe your youngest son and make him come, because remember, they all had to bathe, get ceremonial claim to go meet with Samuel. And they leave him out taking care of the sheep. But he said, I've got him. Verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all means, he was kind of reddish looking. Lighter hair. Beautiful countenance. <coughs> means actually the Hebrews, if you have a different translation. His eyes were very light. And goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And for the first time we've just met the man that's going to be mentioned in the Bible, more than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob together, more than Moses was mentioned over 800 times, David mentioned over 1,000 times in the Bible. We met, And by the way, he's the only David. You'd think that that would become a popular name, like Jesus' name, you know, was Joshua. A lot of Joshua's running around. A lot of Jacob's running around, but never another David we read about in the Bible. But this David here, and he's, you know, I, I, I like what he says here. He was goodly to look to. And he talks about his complexion being more fair, ruddy, actually literally red, Edom, and, uh, and withal. And uh, I think about words that David wrote years later. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. So this is David. We're introduced to it. And the main thing is the Spirit of the Lord, verse 13, came upon him. He anointed him in front of his brethren. So you'd think they would all know something at least going on with this, with this youngest uh, brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. 
And then Samuel just went back to Ramah. And, but then we have this story how that Saul starts having the Spirit of God departs from Saul. Now remember, I said that cannot happen to you because if you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, as long as you're in Christ, because of this fact that, 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 that the Spirit came upon them, the Holy Ghost lives in us. There's a big difference. When you get saved, the very instant you get saved, God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you. He directs your mind, your heart, your guidance. Not your conscious. I mean, you're, that he's not, people say, let your conscious be. You guys say, well, that's all right for unsaved people. But for saved people, we need to let the Holy Ghost be our God and direct us. But Saul starts having these fits of depression. And they said, well, let's bring a musician in to play worship music. And they bring David in. That's not an accident. David gets, for a year, maybe two, he gets to see how the court works and so how Saul behaves and all these sort of things. And and uh, besides that, the music that he plays, because verse 18 says the Lord was with him, calms Saul down. But then David is away from Saul's, because he doesn't stay, stay there all the time. He goes back and forth. And uh, when, the, when the Philistine army comes, in verse 15 of chapter 17, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So he's there. But three of David's older brothers, the oldest three actually, follow King Saul into war. And there you are. And, the, and you know where Judah's at. Judah's always, this is the word of God, Judah's always the first tribe. They're always at the forefront of the battle. That's God's, That's what God told Moses and Joshua to do. So they, David sent with some, some food, some supplies, to take to his older brothers and remember some special gifts for the captain of the thousands. You know, you want to keep on the good side of the people that's got power. And so he sends all that stuff along. And uh, for 40 days, there's been this, the Philistine come out. His name is Goliath. You remember what his name means? The Splendid One. That's a cool name. I don't know anybody named Goliath now because you think of bad things, but that's actually a cool name, the Splendid One. He's a, so that's what his parents named him, and probably he took great pride in it himself, you know. And you see a description of him, all the massive size and all the weaponry and all that stuff that he has. Okay. So that's where we stopped at last week. Verse 23, and I'm going to read verse 23 through verse 26. And as he talked with them, his, his brothers, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name. Like we don't know that name as good as we know any name in the Bible. Out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Now what he heard was back in verse 10, I defy the armies of Israel. My God is better than your God. But their God was nothing. Nothing. Just an idol. But he is putting down Jehovah God, the, the very uh, God of Israel. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, because they'd come out and they'd come out for 40 days, I don't think they ever did fighting this. They, they said they'd make a racket and scream at each other, you know, and, you know, a little bit of psychological warfare. And every day this big God would come out. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. And were sore afraid. And some of the men, and the men of Israel said, talking to David, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is it to come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter. So he become part of the royal family. By the way, David, you know, is going to do this, but he doesn't take advantage of this. A long time goes by, and he doesn't marry the daughter of Saul. Uh, he feels very unworthy. He doesn't feel like that's what God's called him to do. And make his father's house free in Israel. In other words, not that they were slaves, but be free from taxation and uh, having to give to the government for food and stuff like that. Okay. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? Listen, here's what's important. And take away the reproach from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I don't need no prize. It's not what interests me. I want to do what's right for God. That, that's what he's saying. I mean, I don't, we don't really get the picture over here in the King James, but what he's saying is, I don't care about that stuff. <coughs> Somebody should step out. I want to see a three-step process here. Step one is somebody should do something. David don't say it's him or anything, but David's saying surely anybody in Israel 
could go kill this Philistine. You see, David sounds just like Jonathan, Saul's son, did a few chapters ago. When Jonathan said to his armor bearer, let's go kill these uncircumcised Philistines. They're, no, they're not part of the covenant of God's family. They're not one of us. Our God is God, the God that delivered us from Egypt. Our God's a God that fed our families through the wilderness with man. Our God's a God that sent judge after judge. And, and I'm telling you what, Jonathan believes all that stuff. Jonathan's a great man of God. Now, he's not young now. David must be about 18, so Jonathan will be early 40s, mid-40s, something like that. But he's still, still a young man, though. And uh, But he sounds like Jonathan, doesn't he? I mean, somebody should do something. Well, let me read another verse down here in verse 29. We'll, we'll get to it in a minute, but I love because it's the title I'm taking for tonight's lesson. And David said, What have I now done when his brother jumps onto him? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Something should be done. Surely the God of Israel should not be defied like this. Surely somebody should step up. Is there not a cause? Somebody needs to do something. This is God's glory. This is a glory question. David's not concerned about the prizes. He's concerned about God receiving glory. Verse 27. And the people answered after him this matter, saying, Shall it be done unto the man that killed him? China, talk, go back. No, get, the, my, get the attention off us being cowards. Uh, this is what, it's a good thing. They, if anybody really was, they, they've been running their mouth for 40 days. There's an old saying, when all is said and done, you've worked around the minds very much, you know, this is true. There'll be more said than done before it's all done. All right, so it's all said and done. Well, so he says, after this shall the manner so it shall be done to him that killeth him. And alive, I didn't tell you what his name meant last week, the eldest son, the eldest brother. His name means father is God. God is my father. That, that, that is a cool name too. Jesse's a man of God. Jesse's grandparents, remember, were Ruth and Boaz. He is a true man of God, Jesse is. And his oldest brother says, when he heard him, uh, he spake unto the men, Lives anger was kindred against David. This, there's something that's going way back in this family history. Because Eliab would be so much older than him. I was talking with uh, with their neighbor before church, and just in Calvin's family, Calvin's a baby, Sam's the oldest. They're 14 year old difference. I mean, by the time Calvin was very big at all, Sam's married up. And, you know, So th th there's 10 in this family, no 11. Eight, no, no, eight, eight brothers, eight sons, and then the two daughters. So, you know, this, this is the oldest son. This is quite a bit older. And uh, I think about my dad and his his nephews and nieces, because you got to remember there were they had twenty one brothers and sisters. There were twenty two of them, and so uh, many of them were grown by the time he comes along and had children. So he had nieces and nephews older than him, and by the time he's seven years older than the baby, and by the time that the Renda comes along, she's got. Her, some of her, her two oldest sisters are grandparents. Isn't that crazy? Not just parents, they're grandparents. But I mean, so, so this guy, it's not, this seemed weird for somebody this age to be picking on a little brother, but, and maybe he was a little bit of a stinker. I mean, he'd kind of been shoved to the side a whole lot, and he didn't look like the rest of the family, you know. So, and Eli, his, Eli, his oldest brother, uh, heard he's speaking to the men, and Eliab, his anger was kindled against David and said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom there left those few sheep? Guys, I want you to know, here's a good lesson for us tonight. Whenever you step out on faith to do something for God, the first battle is not with the big giant. The first battle is with other church members. It may be with the deacons or with the pastor. It may be with your own family members. I mean, look what Jesus' own the city of Nazareth rejects Jesus. His own brothers and sisters don't even know what to make of him. They think that he has a demon, remember? He's lost his mind. Or Moses, when, when he kills the first Egyptian. And then the Jews don't understand. They said, what are you going to do, kill us too? And then Moses runs away. Moses says to God, they won't respect me. Forty years have gone by, they still won't respect me. Huh. Well, don't be surprised if it's in your own family that this first battle, first challenge comes up. 
and might reject you, might reject your ideas, might, might even belittle you and say, that's few little sheep in the world. I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thine, own, of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou might see the battle. You didn't come and bring us food. Well, I don't know how deep this stuff goes, but David does the right thing. David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned away from him. Sometimes, guys, that's the only thing you can do. If God's called you to do something and no one wants to receive that, I mean, God, you know, you know. Now, first, let me tell you this thing. If, if, you, if you've got some Bible teaching nobody else don't know, don't teach it because it's wrong. I guarantee you it's wrong because if 2,000 years of church history, you're the first one ever to figure out that Satan is a serpent in the cloud. In fact, God taught me this at, uh, one day at the post office. He went on and on. Don't you know the clouds have dust in them and Satan licks the dust of the ground and he's, whew, all right, buddy, just let me get my mail. I want to go, you know. So uh, so if you, if you come up with some weird doctor, it's probably because you just you keep it because it's weird. It ain't right at all, okay, because you ain't smarter than them that's ever lived, you know. But if God calls you to start a youth group or God calls you to, to do a new Sunday school class and they can say, oh, I don't know, just, just do, do. Follow what God's leading you to do. And I really believe in the long run that God will bless that. In fact, I know I don't should say God will bless that if that's what He's called you to do. So, first battle may be with those that uh, love you the most or that's closest to you. So David turned; he did not engage. To his credit, he did not engage. And David turned from him toward another and spake after the, <laughs> after the same manner. Shouldn't somebody do something? And the people a, a, after the same manner, and the people entering him again. After the former manner, that would well, calm down, David. The somebody will do something. There's a big prize. And when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. All right. So, the first challenge is here. Now he's going to face the second challenge. Let me read all the way through verse 37. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Step number two, thy servant will go out. Step number one, somebody ought to do something. <laughs> Let me just warn you right now, when you think somebody ought to do something about a lack in this community, usually that's because God's calling you to be that somebody. Not always, not always. Maybe he's called you to be the helper to somebody that is called. I don't know. But step number two, more than somebody should do something, I'll do something. And fight the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art a youth. And he's a man of war from his youth. So David's not old enough to be in the army, which means he's less than 20. Now, not that everybody had to serve at this point, but because uh, his other brothers, between the oldest three and down to David, evidently one die, has died, because uh, they only mentioned seven of the brothers, uh, including David later. But... Uh, but he's probably, if he was anointed, as all the rabbis say when he was 15, he's probably about 18 now. So he's, he's a teenager. You know something, God does a lot of great things with teenagers, doesn't he? Mary brings the Savior into the world, probably 15. I know some of the commentaries I read say 14 years old, but probably, let's say she's old, 16 years old. She brings the Savior into the world. John and James, they call the less, were both teenagers, and yet they were apostles of God sent out. Jesus sent out to heal the sick and, and cast out demons. And that's something. So don't let people tell you you can't do something. This, this, is what, this, is, this is the second challenge. The challenge from the experts. So he went from insults from his brother to an evaluation. Here's an evaluation. You're not able. Yeah, somebody should do something, David, but it ain't you. Each step of the way, here's lesson to another lesson. With another step comes another lesson. Each step of the way, do something. Expand on your current vision. You might be met with the analysis of paralysis. When people just analyze it to death. Well, let's take time to look at this for over a five-year study. Then we'll decide whether we're going to move the table up front or something. I mean, your churches do crazy things. Let's do a study, you know, and you sometimes, I call it the paralysis of analysis. You get analyzed to death. 
experts say, you're not ready. But well, look what David does. He looks at past victory. David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion. I wish if you got a different translation here. I know Brother David carries the CSB and, and a couple others. I mean, if you got a different translation, it might, it might get this a little better than the King James does. There's nothing wrong with the King James, but the other one, the other translation are more accurate and make it more exciting. Here's what it basically says. Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And whenever there came a lion and a bear, not just one lion and one bear, but any time there came a bear and a lion, took a lamb out of the flock, I went after him, smote him, delivered out of his mouth, and when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and I smote him and I slew him. Wow! All I got to know is this question here. When you have a bear by, or a lion by the beard, what do you have in your other hand? <laughs> I made myself a joke. I thought, of course, nobody thinks my joke's funny. Not even Debbie. I'm going to tell you my joke. Though. I tell you what I want in my other hand. I want somebody that weighs about about 150 pounds to throw in front of them. <laughs> so you're get them to my... uh, no, I really, really, I want a big old 45 in my hand, don't you? I mean, something that I want David a little 38. I want something that'll do the job. And I mean, just blow a hole in that thing. So, what did he Did he have his staff in his hand? Sling it? won't do him no good. He's too close. Maybe he still had some rocks in his pocket, you know, because he, he was, always was with his sling, you know. But he kills this thing. Maybe he had a knife that he kept because it's a dangerous profession. Maybe just his right. I don't know. I don't know what was in his other hand. But whatever it was, God used it. Thy servant. He said, I'm tougher than I look, King Saul. I may look like a little red-headed thing and ain't very big. But I'm tougher than I look. Slew both the lions. Some of the translations have the S there. Definitely should have an S there. And the bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defiled, defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, now the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, I'm, Saul gets fired up, go! And the Lord be with you. He hadn't had this kind of excitement in his life since last. He hadn't been with Samuel in about three or four years. He's not used to somebody with the power of God on them like this. Samuel's not come to see him anymore. He's excited by this young man. Go! Go! Listen, guys. The Lord will deliver me. And I made a little note here. God has saved you from hell. He has shown you love. What more could you demand? And I, I want to read this verse to you from, from the book of Romans, I think I've got to commend to memory, but I, I want to just read it to you anyhow. But God commended his love, his own love. Let me read it right. But God commended his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What more could he do for us? Much more than being now justified by his blood. That's, that's all real. That's not just something churches say. Jesus shed his blood and died on the cross to wash our sins away. We shall be saved from wrath through Jesus. Wow. So, I mean, you say, well, I've never killed a lion or a bear. No, maybe not. But you've been saved from hell by the blood of Jesus Christ. What more could he do for us? Plus, he daily cares for you. Then personal victories. Count your own blessings. Take, a, take courage in the fact that he's never failed you. So why would he start today? He hasn't failed you to this day. You say, well, I haven't always got what I wanted. No, no, that's not what I said. But we always got what God wanted for us if we're walking in His way. Not what we wanted, though. So, He said, I'll supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. All right, verse 38 through verse 34. We're getting there. We're getting there. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. David girded his sword upon his armor. And he essayed to go. He started walking around. For he had not proved it. Tried it out. David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. For I have not proved them. And David put them off. And David took his 
staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, which had even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistines. Step three, after you say somebody needs to do something, second, I'll do something. Step three, go do it. <laughs> Just go do it. He stepped out and trusted God. All right, we'll talk about this again. But, but here's the first thing that jumps out at me. He doesn't even have any ammo till he gets to, to the middle of the battlefield. Remember, the armies are on both sides and then the valley runs between. He doesn't even have anything to fight with except his staff. Then when he gets down to the brook, which the most I've actually seen pictures, I've never been there, the Valley of Eli, it's, a, it's almost... Uh, three quarters of a mile wide. It's a good place for armies to meet. It's not like the Valley of Jehoshaphat, but it's still a big valley. And uh, so he's walking over a quarter of a mile with nothing to, to fight with other than his stick. And he gets to the stream and he finds him five smooth stones. Now I figure he's pretty good with that sling. I mean, he's been out there for hours, Tony, with him or maybe other shepherd boys. I'd say that they'd like, I mean, we'd just do this for hours. Me and my cousins, we'd go down the river and see if we could hit a bottle on the other side of the river and break it up. We'd throw for hours and hours. We just had the best time throwing rocks, you know. And uh, when we got BB guns, man, our arms weren't near sore. We just got to where, you know, that's the coolest thing in the world, you know, to shoot somebody in the head and that happens to you, you know. So, uh, but it was not real guns. It's just BB guns, you know. So, uh, but, uh, so I'm sure David was good. I bet he practiced. Uh, Lord, I could knock that apple out of that tree or whatever. You know what I mean? So he knew what kind of stones to choose. And he chose him five good old stones. Probably about big around as your fist or something. Nice smooth stones that would fly good. Somebody said, why did he choose five? Well, I don't know. I do know that Goliath had four brothers and all the preachers I'd always heard preach said, he, he'd get five in case him other four came out on him. I don't know. But he, he did take five. He only uses one, but he does take five with him. So the third step, not only should someone do something, I'll do something. Finally, David did step out in faith. David went. And then the third challenge is here too. After the challenge of your family saying you're not good enough, after the family, after the challenge of, of the experts saying, hey, we've got to analyze this more and more, there's a third challenge. You've got to use my proven methods. Get my armor on, David. Put my armor on. That'll be the best thing to do. Put my armor. Try my methods. And i never forget something. I think it may have been Oswald Chambers said this over 100 years ago. Men may change and methods change, but the message never change. The message change and men live and die. But the message stays the same. Methods change and men change, but the message stays the same. So you've got to use my proven methods. You get, I, I, okay, I, go on, David. He's all fired up. Go on, go on. You remember what Saul said to him? Go, and the Lord go with you. But put on my armor, though. If you're going to go, at least look good when you go. But you know what? Some of the greatest revivals in the world happened when nobody was expecting a revival. People were praying for it. But then all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost poured out. That's what I'm praying for our nation. That's what I'm praying for McDowell County. God send us a true Holy Ghost revival. Third lesson. Let God use you and trust God as your only Savior, all you need. His way doesn't have to be the way that someone else used, their technology or their techniques. Just follow what God has you to do. Verse 41 through verse 47. David came and drew near and I'm excuse me, the Philistine came and drew near to David, and the man that bare his shield went before him. Now there's two of them and just one of David, and one of them's over nine feet, nine inches tall. But another man comes just carrying his, his shield for him. And when the Philistine looked about, he thought this was a joke. And saw David. He disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy. He didn't look like the princes of Israel. He didn't have dark raven hair and dark eyes. And fair countenance. The Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you come to me with staffs? The Philistine cursed David by his gods, and there's his mistake. Cursed him by his gods, by Dagon, and other gods of the Philistines. 
And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I'll give thy flesh to the fowls of the air, to the beasts of the field. What a voice this man must have. Can you imagine this deep voice screaming out? I'll feed you to the fowls of the air. Probably echoing across the valley. I wonder what everybody else was thinking. When everybody heard this booming voice, I'll feed you. They must have thought, what's Saul doing? He's sending a kid out there? He's just going to make a joke out of things. Then David said to then said David to the Philistines, Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of the host. And the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defiled. I come to you with the name. And I thought, how many times, deacons, have we went out with nothing but the name of Jesus? How, what, do you, what do you got? I got the name of Jesus. That's the most powerful name. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. The world is changed by Jesus. So we've got a name. He knew the name of only the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. And I will smite thee. You know, if you're going to play a game of words and threatening and smack talk, don't forget that David's pretty good with words, isn't he? I mean, after all, look how many songs he's already written as a young man and how many songs he will later. I mean, this guy is outside his... He may be bigger and stronger, but he's not going to be better with words than David, not the sweet psalmist of Israel. David says, come on, I'll smite thee and take thy head from thee and give thy carcass to the host of the Philistines. Uh, car- uh, give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air. I'm not only going to kill you, I'm going to kill all of you. To the wild beasts of the earth. Why? That all the earth, all the Gentiles may know that there is a God in Israel. Not only that, all this assembly, all of Israel shall know that the Lord saves not with a sword or and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands, not just David. David's, what David's saying is, God is going to empower this army that's behind me. I'm just a tip of the spear, so to speak. So David steps out. Uh, it may be hard to underestimate how good that David was with words, but here you see some of them. He says six times, the Lord, the God, the Lord God, the Lord God, Lord God. Verse 45 through verse 47, the Lord God, the victory will be the Lord's. And I just went through it. I didn't even look close. I just flipped through some of the Psalms and said, how many of these Psalms are about victories? I didn't, I I mean, I seriously, I just, every page, page two, Psalm two, yeah, Psalm eight, yeah, Psalm nine, yeah, Psalm 18, Psalm 24, Psalm seven, Psalm 100, Psalm 101, Psalm 107, Psalm 149. I mean, you just, you just open them up and they're just, they Brother Arnold says it's his favorite book of the Bible. He read, and Brother David reads the Psalms every day. Guys, it's a powerful thing to let your heart be. I love this. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's how you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Be not drunk with wine, word of success, but be you filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Praise music, worship music, singing to God. So he steps out and he does it. Here we go. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose, came and drew nigh to meet David. Are you ready for this? I remember the first time I heard this story. The first time I remember hearing it anyhow in Sunday school class. Man alive, I couldn't believe this when the Sunday school teacher said, David ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. It's one thing to have the rocks in your pocket <laughs> and a stick in your hand. But David takes off running to meet that rascal. I mean, he's running at him. I don't care what you say. That's pretty cool. And David put his hand in his bag and took this a stone. Didn't know which one. Just reached in and grabbed it and slang it. I love how the King James translates that word. You know what the word is in Hebrew? Slang it. No, that's not. (laughs) It just means slung or to to toss. Okay, it's just a, but uh, I like the King James. King James is the only one translated. He slang it. He got a hold of it. He gave it all he had. I heard one preacher said he could have thrown it behind his back. It wasn't a man near him. He was going to get there, you know. And that rock was guided by God. 
Now, I'm not saying David wasn't good with it. We know the Benjamites have said that there were over 700 of them that could kill a, a man within a hair's breadth, okay? I mean, you know, that's that's a small amount. Think about a little rabbit, a little hair, hair's breadth. I mean, think about this, man. How, or if you take a width of a hair, you know. There were men in Israel that were good with slings. I don't know if David was this good, but I know one thing. He was good. God used him that day. He slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sank into that old big ugly forehead. You know but, yeah. And he fell upon his face to the earth. Like Dagon, his God. Remember when the years, 40 years or so before this, when they had stolen the Ark of the Covenant and put it in front of their, remember we brought that chapter 3 or 4 of, of, of Samuel? And it says that the, they put, their, put it in front of Dagon and Dagon fell on his face. They stood Dagon up. How do you like having God? you got to stand up. Stood Dagon up. The next day he fell and he broke apart and was laying across the threshold. Let me tell you what, guys. That's how he, this is, reminds me of Dagon. He's running. I'm sure he's not running as fast as David. The big giant's coming. And David, he's leaning forward to the battle pose. David strikes him. He falls on his face. I mean, if you don't like your story, something's wrong with you, man. It's a cool story. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in David's hand. So David ran, and I love the King James here again, and stood upon the Philistine. I know in the Hebrew it says he stood over, which probably <coughs> means he's standing over his head. But I still like the picture as a little kid. David climbing up on top of that old big thick body with all that armor on top of him and getting that sword out. But yeah, he stood over him, stood upon him, whichever way. <clears throat> Drew it out from the sheath and slew. Cut off his head there with. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Remember the deal was, whoever wins, the rest of us will be your servants. That was the deal, right? For 40 days. Well, don't never expect the devil to keep his deal, he says. The devil's a liar and a good liar. So they didn't keep their deal. They took off running. The men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines till they came to the valley at the gates of Ekron. That's right up to the gates of Philistine. And one of the Philistines, and the one of the Philistines fell by the way uh, to Seraphim, even unto Gath, where Goliath was from, and unto Ekron. So the major cities for miles and miles and miles, the closest city seven miles away. They chase the Philistines, they kill them, and they kill them, and they kill them. And the men of Jew, Israel and Judah, obviously it's Israel and Judah because they're a divided nation already, even though technically they're not. Judah, the man the men in the front, shouted and pursued the Philistines. By the way, which child was David from? Judah, Judah yes. Pursued the Philistines until they come to the... Oh, I read it. Okay. And the children of Israel turned from chasing the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. They went in and they took their food, their weapons, whatever they left behind. They spoiled their tents. Remember, it said only a few years before this, three or four years before this, that, uh, that they, they didn't... No, no, it's been several years, about maybe eight or ten. They didn't have... Only people that even had swords, remember, was Jonathan and, uh, and men were actually with him and, and Saul. So a very small number... So they take all of this. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. Remember, he's from Bethlehem, so this is just a... Now they're, they're just one big town, but at this time they may have been about two miles apart. And uh, years later, he'll make that his, his capital city. He brings it to Jerusalem, but he put the armor in his tent. That's right. You might not like this, ladies. But he's carrying that old big jug head around with him. Blood pouring out of it to make nothing but a white face and eyes sunk back. There he is, carrying that head around. He takes it up to Jerusalem. So the Jebusites that still have control of most of Jerusalem could see that there's a God in Israel. Hallelujah. It'll be there. And David will make it his capital later. And Saul, and when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the captain of his host, remember, Abner's his first cousin, Abner, whose son is this youth? Now you say, well, I thought he knew David. Well, he knows David somewhat. But, and they told him when, he, when they brought David to the camp, it's the son of Jesse. But Saul's like most kings. He don't care who his servants are. So, you know, 
Uh, but now he has to carry because whose family, whoever this, whoever, whatever warrior kills, their family's going to be set free from taxes forever. So we got to know exactly who, who's this family is this. And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son this stripling is. And David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines and took and Abner took him and brought him before Saul. What's the next part say? <laughs> I love it. He's still toting that big ugly head around. Maybe he's got it by the beard. I always picture him having it by the hair of the head, but he may have it by the beard like he did that line. I don't know how he's carrying that old big head. But he's carrying it with him. I guess it'll look good beside his bare skin and his lion skins, won't it? And plus he takes and put all the armor in his tent. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse. And we've already read that Jesse was the old man in the days of Saul. Thy servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. You know, it's going to, Bethlehem's going to be a more famous city because of David. It's already famous because of Ruth and Boaz, but it's going to be more famous and even more famous. We'll sing about it all around the world. The little town of Bethlehem. But it ain't David we're singing about. It's the son of David, isn't it? <laughs> all right. Israel's victory. Israel's victory. Others were blessed because David had courage. And you know what? Others will be blessed because you have courage too. David said this is going to be the whole nation's victory, not just my victory. Air. He said that to the giant when he's running toward the, the Lord deliver you, all the Philistines, into our hands. This is God going to do this. He read toward the army. All right, so others were blessed by his victory. Uh, so verse 56, Saul pays attention finally to who's David's family is. And then I want to read you a quote from Dr. Warren Wiersbe. It has been said that there are people who make things happen. There are people that watch things happen. And there are people who don't know anything did happen. <laughs> Which kind of people is you? I think that applies pretty well. For I, Dr. Wiersbe didn't have these steps, but it applies pretty well to the steps that, that I've said this evening. There are going to be people that make it happen. That's step three, the ones that step out and do something. There are going to be some people watch things happen. They say, uh, you know, uh, they need a volunteer. <laughs> Somebody should do something. You know, then there's going to be something some people don't even know what's happening. Let's read these four verses and we'll quit because I want to introduce you to the love of Saul and, I mean, Jonathan and David, verse 1 through 4. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit, literally, chained. It's a word chained, bound with the soul of David. Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Wow. They're not the same age. One's a king's son. One's a shepherd. One was brought up in luxury. The king's son. He's in his 40s. This David is not even 20 years old. Jonathan has sons of his own. In fact, his oldest son probably by this time is about 14, maybe 16. But Jonathan loves this man, David, this young man. And Saul took him that day and wouldn't let him no more go home to his father. So now David's a permanent part of the court. And Jonathan, the great man of God, always a great man of God, that loved God, loved the God of the covenant, and loved God's covenant people, the circumcised. Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments even to his sword and to his bow and his girdle. And he gives David these things. I guess something that warriors that put their life on the line together can imagine. <clears throat> the kind of love that you'd have for a man that would stand beside you in the foxhole and fight the battles with you. But what Jonathan is saying is this. Let me hurry up. Jonathan, Jonathan said, I respect you as an equal. We may not be equals in age, but we are equals in our love for God and His covenant people. Neither are going to put up with these uncircumcised Philistines. In chapter 20, they will literally make a covenant and make it official. Jonathan at that by then will know that David is going to be king and not him. And Jonathan's fine with that. And David says to Jonathan, as the Lord lives, your family will never be harmed by me. 
there's already a rift between Saul and David in the next two chapters. And he says to Jonathan, you will be the leader of all the armies and you'll be the leader behind me. He loved Jonathan as much as Jonathan loved him. Same heart, same God, as different as it were. And guys, it's always good to know that we've got each other. Some may turn their back. Some may fuss at you because they don't agree with your ideals. But guess what? In the end, we've got to have each other. Because the world hates us. The world hates us. And we certainly do need each other. Father, we love you. We praise you for your blessings that you give to us. I pray, Lord, that you'd take these handful of lessons, but all uh, dozens of others that the Holy Ghost is speaking to people this evening. Put them in our hearts that we might not sin against you. God, do bless. I want to add my prayers to the other prayers this evening, Lord God, that you bless our people. Bless the meetings that Brother Danny and Sister Ann have, and bless Sister Cheryl, Lord God, with the healing. And all the ones being mentioned this evening, so many, Lord God, some are own little children that are sick. Touch their bodies, Lord God, and give them the healing they need. Bless Kai's appointment tomorrow, Lord God. All the unspoken requests, you know every hand that was raised, every desire of our heart. Bless us, Lord God, to be faithful to you in the little things. Someday you'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over the small things. I'll make you ruler over many. Help us to be more like you every day. And that's like ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.